Hello, welcome to BEH 229 Family Counseling. <clears throat> Today we're going to be discussing transgenerational models in family counseling. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Bowen's family theory is where we're going to start. Um, he is pretty much the one of the main people to really work on family counseling. A key figure who remained very important in this field until 1990 when he died um, is Murray Bowen and on the right hand side you'll see a copy of his book Bowen was the developer of family systems theory and he saw the family as an emotional unit Bowen's contributions bridge the approaches that emphasize the significance of past family relationships on an individual and systems approach that focuses on the family unit as it is presently and how it is interacting. He believed that the driving force underlying all human behavior came from the submerged ebb and flow of family life, the simultaneously pushing and pulling between family members for both distance and togetherness. This attempt to balance two life forces family togetherness and individual autonomy was for Bowen the core issue for all humans. With a successful balance people are able to maintain intimacy with loved ones while differentiating themselves sufficiently as individuals, meaning having outside friends and outside um, experiences and not just uh, creating this dysfunction within a family unit that feeds off of each other. Curious about the family relations of impatience, Bowen became particularly interested in researching the possible transgenerational impact of a mother-child symbiosis, and symbiosis means interdependence, in the development and maintenance of schizophrenia. The psychoanalytic concept that schizophrenia might resolve from an unresolved symbiotic attachment to the mother, herself immature and in need of the child to fill her own emotional needs, Bowen began studying the emotional fusion between schizophrenic patients and their mothers. The uh, little cartoon on the right, bow and arrow, the bow is saying, come back, you're nothing without me. And that's really what symbiosis is, is they can't survive without each other and although emotionally it may not seem like a bad thing it then leads to codependency and um, an unwillingness to separate from one's family of origin even for the most basic experiences. Bowen discovered that the emotional intensity of the mother-child interaction was even more powerful than he had suspected. More importantly, the emotional intensity seemed to describe relationships throughout the family, not merely those between mother and child. So now we're finally, mom, you're not always at fault. We're going to look at everybody in the family. Fathers and siblings were also found to play key roles in developing and perpetuating family problems. Bowen expanded his earlier mother-child symbiosis concept to viewing the entire family as an unbalanced emotional unit made up of members unable to separate or successfully differentiate themselves from one another. Bowen had moved from concentrating on the patient with the disease to a focus on the whole family. Then he began to direct his attention to what he called the family emotional system, a kind of family guidance system shaped by evolution that governs its behavior. Bowen was beginning to formulate a new theory of human behavior which he called the family systems theory, which is derived from the biological view of the human family as one type of living system. According to this theory, the human family is seen as part of an evolutionary process in nature. Like all living systems, i.e. ant colonies, the tides, the solar system, Humans and the human family are guided by processes common in nature, in particular 
the theory concerns itself with a special kind of natural system, the family's emotional system. Bowen's theory of the family as an emotional relationship system consists of eight interlocking concepts, six of which address emotional processes taking place in the nuclear and extended family. Two concepts, emotional cutoff and societal emotional process, speak to the emotional processes across generations in a family and in society. All eight constructs are interlocking, so none is fully understandable apart from the others. The eight concepts are tied together by the underlying premise that chronic anxiety is omnipresent in life. And, you know, we all feel stress and anxiety, but to different degrees and how we manage it. From its from this natural systems perspective, past generations has tra transmitted chronic anxiety, which impacts family members as they balance togetherness and autonomy. In humans, anxiety stimulates the emotional system, overriding the cognitive system and leading to behavior that is automatic or uncontrolled. If greater togetherness prevails, imbalance results and the family moves toward increased emotional functioning and less individual autonomy, leading the person to experience increased chronic anxiety. So if you imagine a number line and that is your, your continuum of stress and anxiety, on the one side, on the left side, you have among, you know, emotional functioning and on the left side, you have less individual autonomy. Well, that's when the less individual autonomy you have, the more anxiety you have. So Bowen's family systems theory has the eight forces that shape family functioning. And they are, and we're going to talk about each one individually. Number one, differentiation of self. Number two, triangles. Number three, nuclear family emotional system. Number four, family projection process. Number five, emotional cutoff. Number six, multi-generational transmission process. Number seven, sibling position. And number eight, societal emotional process. So let's talk about number one, differentiation of self. This is the cornerstone of the Bowen family systems theory is the notion of forces within the family that lead to an in, lead to individuality and the opposing forces that make for togetherness. Differentiation of self reflects the extent to which a person is able to distinguish between intellectual process and the feeling process of what he or she is experiencing. Quote, the person who balances emotional reactivity and thinking without regard to the family's emotional processes thought to be functioning at a higher level of differentiation of self. So for example, a student chooses to go to college. After living away, she comes home at mid-year to attend her sister's wedding. What degree is she drawn into, to what degree is she going to be drawn into family feuds, conflicts, coalitions, or emotional turmoil that occur around the wedding? Her differentiation can be gauged by the degree to which she is able to remain sufficiently involved to, ple to enjoy the pleasures of this family event while sufficiently separated so as not to be drawn into the emotional system, or in this case the family wedding drama. Individuals with the greatest fusion between their thoughts and feelings function most poorly they are likely to be at the mercy of automatic or involuntary emotional reactions and tend to become dysfunctional even under low levels of anxiety. Unable to differentiate thought from feeling, such persons have trouble differentiating themselves from others and merge easily with whatever emotions dominate or sweep through the family. Highly fused persons with few firmly held positions of their own are apt to remain emotionally stuck throughout their lives in the position they occupied in their families of origin. 
Bowen later recast the term undifferentiated family ego mass into systems language as fusion differentiation. Both terms underscore the transgenerational view that maturity and self-actualization demand that an individual become free of unresolved emotional attachments to his or her family of origin. Sounds much easier than it is. Bowen differentiation of self scale ding distinguishes people according to the degree of fusion or differentiation between their emotional and intellectual functioning. So starting at <clears throat> the low end of differentiation, if you score below a 50, you get the outcome of trying to please others, supporting others, but also seeking support, dependent, lack of capacity for autonomy, primary need for security, avoids conflict, little ability to independently reach decisions or solve problems. So that is someone who is highly, highly fused. Then we have our mid-range, 51 to 75. Definite beliefs and values, but tends to be over-concerned with the opinions of others. May make decisions based on emotional reactivity, especially whether significant others will approve. Then we move into our high differentiation. People have clear values and beliefs. They are goal-directed, flexible, secure, autonomous. They can tolerate conflict and stress, and they have a well-defined sense of solid self. So, you know, high differentiation from one's family doesn't necessarily mean that you're not close to your family. It just means that you're not emotionally hijacked by your family every time there's drama going on. Bowen's family systems theory assumes that an instinctively rooted life force in every human propels the developing child to grow up to be an emotionally separate person able to think, feel, and act as an individual. At the same time, a corresponding life force propels the child and family to remain emotionally connected. So because of these counterbalancing forces, no one ever actually achieves complete emotional separation from the family of origin. You know, we can move 3,000 miles across the country, but with modern technology, we can FaceTime and video call and Skype, and you still get pulled into drama. Second, we have triangles. This Bowen family system theory also emphasizes the emotional tension within an individual or in that person's relationships. For example, the greater the fusion in a couple, the more difficult it is to find a stable balance satisfying both. One way to diffuse such an anxious two-person relationship is to triangulate, meaning to draw in a significant family member to form a three-person interaction. Triangulation is a common way that two-person systems under stress attempt to achieve stability. Therefore, the basic building block in a family's emotional or relational system is the triangle. And interestingly, if you go back to ancient Rome and ancient Greece, rocks that were the shape of a triangle were called the keystone because they held all the other rocks in place. So kind of... Um, a little historical construct context for you. Bowen refers to the triangle as the smallest stable relationship system. By definition, a two-person system is unstable and forms a three-person system under stress as each partner creates a triangle in order to reduce the tension in their relationship. As more people become involved, the system may become a series of interlocking triangles, in some cases intensifying the very problem that the triangulation sought to resolve. So if you have all of these interlocking triangles, you are essentially exponentially increasing the amount of potential um, problems that occur in these triangles. So Kerr and Bowen point out that triangulation has at least four possible outcomes. 
a stable twosome can be destabilized by the addition of a third person. For example, the birth of a child brings conflict to a harmonious marriage. So, you and your love muffin, you get married, you adopt or have a baby, and instead of things being fabulous, it then can become a little bit not so fabulous. Um, chores are not distributed evenly. There's a lot of different issues that can occur. Number two, a stable twosome can be destabilized by the removal of a third person. So when the child grows up and leaves home and is thus no longer available to be triangulated into the parental conflict. So, you know, 30 years after you get married, your kids all have left the nest. And now you looking at your spouse and saying, why am I with this person? And you don't have your child to keep you stable. Number three, an unstable twosome can be stabilized by the addition of a third person. A conflictual marriage becomes more harmonious after the birth of a child, which by the way is not usual. That is one of those outcomes that you don't see very much. Um, what you do tend to see is an unstable twosome can be stabilized by the removal of a third person. Conflict is reduced by getting a third person, say the mother-in-law, who has consistently taken sides, out of the picture. So you have an unhappily married couple and everything points to the fact that his mother or her mother gets in the way all the time and, you know, remove them from the equation, whether through, you know, moving to another state or the mother-in-law passes away it will then restabilize that couple. For example, conflict between siblings quickly attracts a parent's attention. Assume that the parent has positive feelings towards both children. In other words, both kids are great, she loves them both. If the parent can control his or her emotional responsiveness and not take sides while staying in contact with both children, the emotional tense intensity between the siblings will diminish. As McGoldrick and Carter observe, involvement in triangles and interlocking triangles represents a key mechanism such that patterns of relating to one another are transmitted over generations in a family. And this is one of those very specific things. If you grow up in a family, where your mother or your father constantly complain to you about their spouse, you're going to grow up believing that complaining about your spouse to your children is an acceptable behavior. When really what you're doing is you're creating a situation where they feel, the children feel, that they may have to take sides at some point. So the parent has to be neutral in terms of complaining about their spouse to their children and they also have to not pick sides between the siblings because even though you know the both siblings are at fault you do see a lot of times a parent particularly picking on the older child for not being more responsible number three nuclear family emotional system Bowen contends that people choose mates with levels of differentiation equivalent to their own. A relatively undifferentiated person will be attracted to a person who is equally fused to his or her family of origin. These poorly differentiated people, now married, likely will become highly fused and produce a family with the same characteristics. So that's how we go through that transgenerational concept of, you know, this couple have the same relatively undifferentiated separation from their family. So when they have their kids, they're going to expect the same kind of relationship. And those kids, when they grow up, are going to also have the same kind of relationship of not being undifferent or of a being undifferentiated. 
Bowen indicated that the resulting nuclear family emotional stability emotional system will be unstable and will seek to reduce tension and maintain stability. The greater the nuclear family's fusion, the increased likelihood of anxiety and potential instability, and the greater the family's propensity to seek resolution through fighting, distancing, exploiting the compromised functioning of one partner, or banding together over concern for a child. Kerr and Bowen note three possible symptomatic patterns in a nuclear family when partners are intensely fused. Now a nuclear family, just to make sure we are all on the same page with that, is mom, dad, or mom, mom, dad, dad, the two parents, and however many children they may have. So we don't include grandparents, we're not including cousins, we're not including uh, uncles and aunts, so just that nuclear family. Physical or emotional dysfunction in a spouse. Overt, chronic, unresolved, marital, marital conflict. And psychological impairment in a child. So when the nuclear family is overly fused, these are the outcomes you tend to see. Dysfunction in one spouse may take the form of an over-adequate, under-adequate reciprocity in which one partner takes on most or even all family responsibilities, for example, earning a living, caring for the children, cooking, shopping, arranging a social life, and so on, while the other plays the counterpart role of being under-responsible, can't drive without anxiety, can't choose their own clothes, can't have friends to the house, Fused together, the two pseudo-selves develop an arrangement in which one partner increasingly underfunctions, while the other takes up the slack by assuming responsibility for them both. When the tilt gets too great, according to Singleton, the one giving up more pseudo-self for the fake sake of family harmony becomes vulnerable to physical or emotional dysfunction. They're being basically taken advantage of. You know, they're taking care of everything in the family, and then the other partner is doing nothing. And this is definitely a recipe for disaster. Moving on to number four, family projection process. The nuclear family emotional system is a multi-generational concept. Bowen believed that poorly differentiated parents themselves immature, select as the object of their attention the most infantile of all their children, regardless of his or her birth order in the family. Bowen calls this transmission experience the family projection process. The intensity of the family pro projection process is related to two factors. Number one, the degree of immaturity or undifferentiation of the parents, and two, the level of stress or anxiety the family experiences. Theorists believe individuals tend to repeat in their marital choices and other significant relationships the patterns of relating learned in their families of origin and to pass along similar patterns to their children. Parents do not respond in the same way to each child in a family despite any claims to the contrary. Consequently, they pass on their level of differentiation to the children in an uneven fashion. So there might be two or three kids in the family and you all go to mom and say, which one of us is your favorite? And mom says, oh, I love you all equally. Well, she may want you to believe that, but the reality is most parents have a particular favorite for whatever reason. And that's the level of intensity in that relationship will determine how they pass on that level of either differentiation or individuality. In particular, those children more exposed to parent parental immaturity tend to gr develop greater fusion to the family than their more fortunate siblings and have greater difficulty separating smoothly from their parents. The fusion prone, focused on child, is the one most sensitive to incipient signs of instability and other disturbances within the family. 
In a triangulating scenario described by Singleton, the child responds anxiously to the mother's anxiety as principal caretaker. The mother becomes alarmed at what she perceives as the child's problem and becomes overprotective. Thus, a cycle is established which the mother infantilizes the child, who in turn becomes demanding and impaired. The third leg of the triangle is supplied by the father, who is frightened by his wife's anxiety and by needing to calm her, but, without dealing with the issues, plays a supportive role in her dealings with the child. As collaborators, the parents have now stabilized their relationship around a disturbed child and in the process perpetuated the family triangle. That person will be less able to function autonomously in the future. Moving on to number five, emotional cutoff. Children less involved in the projection process are apt to emerge with a greater ability to withstand fusion to separate thinking and feeling. In Bowen's formulation, cutting oneself off emotionally from one's family of origin often represents a desperate effort to deal with unresolved fusion with one or both parents, a way of managing the unresolved emotional attachment to them. Bowen considers such supposed freedom an emotional cutoff, a flight of extreme emotional distancing in order to break emotional ties, and not true emancipation. Cutoffs occur most often in families in which there is a high level of anxiety and emotional dependence. When a family member insists on communication, it is apt to be superficial, inauthentic, and brief short visits or phone calls during which only impersonal topics are discussed. Number six, multi-generational transmission process. Bowen proposed the concept of multi-generational transmission process in which severe dysfunction is developed as the result of chronic anxiety transmitted over several generations. Two earlier concepts are crucial here. Number one, the selection of a spouse with similar differentiation level. And number two, the family projection process that results in lower levels of self-differentiation for the targeted offspring who is often particularly sensitive to parental emotional patterns. By contrast, Children less involved in parental overfocusing can develop a higher level of differentiation than their parents. So a single multi-generational family may create individuals at various points of differentiation. So in a family where there might be three kids, one of the children is selected by the mother or the father to basically create that fusion experience whereas the other two are left to their own devices in large part because they don't provide that parent with the emotional connectivity that the parent craves and therefore as they grow up are much more easily able to separate from the parental dysfunction. Number seven, sibling position. Bowen credits Toman's research on the relationship between birth order and personality with clarifying his own thinking regarding the influence of sibling position in the nuclear family emotional process. Bowen realized that interactive patterns between marital partners may be related to the position of each partner in his or her family of origin since birth order frequently predicts certain roles and functions within one's emotional system. For example, an oldest child who marries a youngest may expect to take responsibility, make more decisions, and so forth. So just to briefly go over the differences between first, middle, last, or an only child, First children tend to be natural leaders, high achievers, organized, on time, know-it-alls, bossy, responsible, adult-pleasing, and obeys the rules. Whereas the middle child tends to be flexible, easygoing, social peacemakers, independent, secretive, may feel life is unfair, they become strong negotiators, and they're very generous. 
The last are risk takers, outgoing, creative, self-centered, financially irresponsible, competitive, bored easily, likes to be pampered, and has a good sense of humor. Then you have your only children. They're close to their parents. They have a lot of self-control. They tend to be a leader and very mature, dependable, but demanding, unforgiving, private, and very sensitive. Now here's the important thing, how it is a person's functional position in the family system, not necessarily the actual order of birth that shapes future expectations and behaviors. So the firstborn in your family may be a complete, um, be, act more like a uh, baby of the family, and, and the middle child may then step up and take on the characteristics of the oldest child. So when you have these concepts here, you want to think about functional position much more than the actual order of birth. Then we have the societal emotional process. The concept of societal emotional process describes how the emotional system governs behavior on a societal level, promoting both progressive and regressive periods in a society. For example, the downward spiral in families dealing with a teenager who is getting into trouble and skipping school is an anxiety-driven regression in functioning. In a regression, people act to relieve the anxiety of the moment rather than act on principle and a long-term view. So in this context, a regression with a teenager who acts like this they are just going to start ignoring their teenager's behavior because they don't want to deal with it. They don't know how to deal with it. So they essentially let that teenager do whatever he or she wants. Bowen predicted that a family in a, gro in a regression will continue until the repercussions stemming from taking the easy way out on tough issue exceeds the short-term pain associated with acting in a long-term view. So with that teenager, they may decide to send them to military school or to make them drive them to school or make them take online classes, you know, online high school. What you're seeing here is progressive is something that will improve the situation. Regressive is something that will make the situation in the long term bad. But with regressive, you're also dealing with a lot of denial. And then there's a little cartoon. We've got a really bad case of regression out here. And there's an adult man in a wagon with a baby bonnet on and his mustache. So in the Bowen Family Systems Therapy process, you're looking at the evaluation interview. Kerr and Bowen caution the therapist against being drawn into the family emotional system. The most important work is done by the patient in relationship to his or her family and not to the therapist. A therapist who becomes fused with the family's emotional system, triangulated into their conflicts, or engulfed by their anxiety, can have a divisive influence on family functioning and fail to promote further differentiation among family members. So if the therapist starts to take sides and um, empathizes more with one spouse than the other, then you begin to see this fusion exist. Objectivity as opposed to emotional reactivity should characterize the therapist's behavior. It is important to stay connected to all participants without taking sides. Bowen believed that the more a therapist has worked on becoming differentiated from his own his or her own family of origin, the more the therapist can remain detached and objective. As Friedman points out, it is the therapist's presence, engaging without being reactive, stimulating without rescuing, teaching a way of thinking rather than using any specific behavior or therapeutic intervention technique that is the ultimate agent of change. 
Family evaluation interviews begin with a history of the presenting problem, focusing especially on the symptoms, i.e. physical, emotional, and social, and their impact on symptomatic person or the relationship. The therapist attempts to assess the pattern of emotional functioning as well as the intensity of the emotional process in the nuclear family all of the symptomatic of the symptomatic person what is the relationship system like in this family what are the current stressors how well differentiated are the family members what is the family's adaptive level how stable is the family and how and how successfully does it handle anxiety what triangles exist are emotional cutoffs operating so the therapist during that evaluation interview is paying attention to all of these aspects that Bowen put out as the eight core elements the initial interview which may extend over several sessions seeks information to assess the degree of family dysfunction associated with the pre presenting symptoms which may appear in one or more family members. Bowenians are particularly interested in number one, the historical pattern of family emotional functioning, number two, the family's anxiety levels at varying stages of its life, and number three, the amount of stress experienced in the past compared with current functioning. Of special interest, too, is to assess whether one spouse's functioning has improved significantly and the other spouse has declined significantly over the course of their relationship. The final part of the evaluation interview attempts to understand the nuclear family in the context of the maternal and paternal extended family systems. The therapist is interested in extended families and the degree of emotional cutoff of each spouse, parallels in relationship patterns between the husband and wife of his or her parents may offer important clues of poor differentiation from the families of origin. The therapist's goal is to develop a road map of the family's emotional system since each nuclear family is believed to embody emotional processes and patterns of preceding generations. And this is where the genogram, which we've talked about in other classes, and uh, in this class in particular, comes into play. The genogram may suggest certain emotional patterns in each partner's family of origin thus providing data for assessing each spouse's degree of fusion to extended families and to one another. McGoldrick, Gerson, and Petrie, researchers who are strongly transgenerational in outlook, suggest that family patterns tend to repeat themselves. What happens in one generation will often occur in the next as the same unresolved emotional issues are played out from generation to play to generation. Bowen's family systems therapy, no matter the presenting clinical problem, is governed by two basic goals. One, management of anxiety and relief from symptoms, and two, an increase in each participant's level of differentiation in order to improve adaptiveness. Generally speaking, the family needs to accomplish the former goal before the latter can be undertaken. And ultimately, overreactive emotional interactions with the extended family must be changed, leading to greater self-differentiation for s the nuclear family members. To help remove an adult client from a highly charged emotional triangle with parents, solo visits to the family of origin may be appropriate. Because Bowen was particularly concerned that his clients develop the ability to differentiate themselves from their families of origin, the focus of much of his work was on extended families. Re-establishing emotional connectedness with the family of origin, especially when rigid and previously impenetrable boundaries have been built up, is a critical step in reducing a client's residual anxiety due to emotional cutoff, in detriangulating from members of that family, 
and in ultimately achieving self-differentiation, free of crippling entanglements from the past and present. Bowen presented himself as a researcher helping the family members become objective researchers in their own ways of functioning. The term he preferred was coach. Having moved during his career, in his words, from couch to coach, an active expert who calmly assists family members through low-key direct questions in defining and clarifying their emotional responsiveness to one another. In the process, family members were encouraged to listen, think about their situation, control their emotional reactivity, and learn to self-defining I positions. Successful coaching helps the individual re-enter the system by developing authentic, emotionally engaged relationships with other family members rather than repeating old, dysfunctional family patterns. McGoldrick and Carter describe the process as follows. The basic idea of coaching is that if you can change the part you play in your family and hold it despite the family's reaction while keeping in emotional contact with family members, you maximize the likelihood, which is not a guarantee, that you will eventually change to accommodate they will eventually change to accommodate your change. So if you hold steady, your family will have no choice but to change to accommodate you. Bowen took the position that the successful addition of a significant other, a friend, teacher, clergyman, to an anxious or disturbed relationship system can modify all relationships within the family, and they're called a detached, involved position. Doing family therapy by coaching individual family members to change themselves in the context of their nuclear and parental family systems has become a prominent part of Bowen Family Systems Therapy. Genograms sometimes help define that person's role in the system. Process questioning also helps clarify for the client and his or her role in the family's role in the system. Process questioning can also help clarify for the client his or her role in the family's emotional life. So we're going to move on to another family systems therapist. He created contextual therapy and his name, which I am going to butcher, is Ivan Bozor Menvi Nagi, was the primary pioneer of this new therapeutic style. Contextual therapy, as elaborated in a collection of papers spanning 30 years by Nagi, adds an ethical perspective, trust, loyalty, transgenerational indebtedness and entitlements as well as fairness in relationships between family members. To function effectively, family members must be held ethically accountable for their behavior with one another and must learn to balance entitlement, what one is due or has come to merit, with indebtedness, what one owes to whom. A core concept in contextual theory is relational ethics, which focuses attention on the long term, up and down balance of fairness among members within a family, where the welfare interests of each participant are taken into account by the others. Relational ethics encompasses both individual psychology, i.e. what transpires within the person, and systems characteristics, the roles, power alignment, and communication sequence within the family. A marital couple, for example, must develop a symmetrical give and take, balancing rights and responsibilities, merits and obligations toward one another in order to maintain and continue to build the relationship. Symptoms may appear when trustworthiness and caring within a family break down. To, to contextual therapists, the pattern of relating within a family that are passed on from generation 
are keys to understanding individual as well as family functioning. Trust is the fundamental property of relationships and it can be depleted or restored depending on the capacity of family members to act upon a sense of loyalty and indebtedness in their give and take with one another. Loyalty to people with significant influence in our life, for example, parents, grandparents, coaches, teachers, etc., may help us keep a dream alive and persist through to achieving it. Baza Morveni, Naji, again, mangling it, joined initially with Geraldine Spark and together the pair advanced a theory based upon invisible loyalty within a family, in which children unconsciously take on responsibilities to aid their parents, often to their own detriment. For example, a child becomes a failure to confirm parental forecasts. Invisible loyalty may keep us stuck pursuing a life course many of those same influencers expected even when it is not our passion nor a match to our skill set. Naji and Spark proposed a set of therapeutic techniques designed to uncover and resolve family obligations and debts incurred over time using the metaphor of a family ledger on which these accounts are kept. This multi-generational accounting system tracks what has been given and who, psychologically speaking, still owes what to whom. They also introduced the term family legacy, which are expectations handed down from previous generations concerning what is expected of men and women. So, in some families, women are expected to take a subservient role to the men, and oftentimes in a modern society, that will be fought vociferously by the girls in the family. They also introduce the term family loyalty, referring to allegiances in children based on parental fairness in order to emphasize that family members inevitably develop a set of expectations and responsibilities towards each other. So who owes who? Naji and Krasner argue that traditional interventions, either individually or family focused, consistently ignore family balances due, either owed or deserved, especially intergenerational ones. Yet people in or out of therapy constantly raise such questions as what do I owe and to whom and what do I deserve and from whom what relationships do I need and want because of such family imperatives Naji and Ulrich point out the children are ethically bound to accommodate their lives somehow to their legacies Ulrich gives the following graphic example a son whose familial legacy is one of mistrust among family members angrily confronts his wife every time she spends any money without his prior approval. He is convinced of and tries to convince her that her untrustworthy spendthrift behavior is going to bankrupt them. In fact, the wife who works full time as well as tending to their child contributes to the family solvency. If her response to his anger is fear, a legacy she carries from her own family, she may hide her purchases. His discovery of such concealment reinforces his mistrust. His subsequent anger strengthens her fears. Together their legacies have had a corrosive effect on their marriage. In ledger terms, he is still making payments to his mother's injunction that a wife is not to be trusted. By overpaying his mother, he is robbing his wife. She in turn may be paying off similar debts in terms of that aforementioned fear. Contextual therapy would direct them to reassess all of their relationships, pay off legitimate filial debts, and free themselves from oppressive obligations. 
While the reduction of stress is an important goal in this as in all therapies, the fundamental goal of contextual therapy is the improvement of family members' capacity for relatedness. Multi-directed partiality is the therapeutic process in which the position of each person is considered in turn with fairness and impartiality. Contextual therapists do not focus on pathology, but rather focus on the family's relational resources. That is, they help each family member explore the possibility of earning entitlements from others by appropriate giving to them. Advocates of this view insist that individual autonomy cannot be achieved without a genuine consideration of others. Clients are encouraged to consider the interest of others as ultimately benefiting both the giver and the receiver. Finally, we're going to look at the ethical connection within goals. The ethical dimension gives contextual therapy its uniqueness, insisting that they are not moralizing or taking a judgmental position, practitioners of this approach contend that they offer a realistic strategy for preventing individual and relational imbalance and eventually breakdown. Contextual therapy helps rebalance the obligations kept in the invisible family ledger by identifying imbalances directing efforts at settling old family accounts, for example, mothers and daughters stuck in a lifelong conflict, exonerating alleged culprits, or transforming unproductive patterns of relating that may have existed through the family over many past generations. Practitioners of contextual therapy maintain that families cannot be fully understood without an explicit awareness of family loyalty, who is bound to whom, what is expected of all family members, how loyalty is expressed, what happens when loyalty accounts are uneven, we were there for you when you were growing up and now we, your aging parents, are entitled to help, entitled to help from you. So uh, that is it for today. If you have any questions, please email or text your instructor. If you are not a student at our college, please leave a comment and we will try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Have a great day.